thank you very much for the uh, generous introduction, which I mostly understood, um, and for the joke, which is very tough to follow. Um, if we can get my slides here. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk this morning in the few minutes I have about childhood onset disorders and in particular about developmental psychopathology and how we can put it in the context of the overall care system, but how we need to begin to think about the role that it plays in the lives of children. So what we tend to forget is that the world has changed a great deal when we think about children. Not so many years ago, 50 or less, the real focus in children's health care was on infectious disease. Children were dying of many, many different kinds of infections or ended up disabled with diseases like polio, et cetera. These diseases are virtually gone in the developed world and certainly in places like Europe and America. But the approach to caring for children and the new diseases or the new problems that have taken their place haven't been the focus of the care systems. And this turns out to be terribly problematic. Largely, the care system is an acute disease model. That is, most people think that children will get well and immediately and that'll be the end of it, when in fact, we really have to focus on more of a chronic disease model. The notion that, don't worry, they'll grow out of it, is simply misguided. It's not true. It's certainly true that most children develop well and with few problems. But when they do encounter difficulties, many recover, but some do not. Let's try to think about this a little bit and look at some of the data. The prevalence of childhood onset disorders which can be quite dramatic, but also dramatically different. Think of the disorders that garner the most attention, like cancer, diabetes, and asthma. With the exception of asthma, they're relatively rare. And then look at the disorders that often don't get attention, but are equally important, those in the area of developmental psychopathology, where the prevalence of these conditions is quite high, and for many of the individuals, chronicity is a significant problem. So what can we say about childhood onset disorders? They're relatively common, they're often chronic, and developmental psychopathology is the most common of all. And by the way, the World Health Organization has recognized this by looking at the lifespan and realizing that the psychiatric illnesses that follow from developmental psychopathology represent, if not the largest, one of the top three or four burdens of disease for the entirety of, uh, of humanity. But nonetheless, psychiatric disorders are unevenly represented in terms of clinical training, not just for psychiatrists, but for pediatricians and family doctors and nurses and others. And research is much less well supported, at least not even remotely in proportion to prevalence or impact of disorder. And specialty practice is profoundly limited. The number of people who can take care of these disorders with expertise is sorely lacking in both developed countries and in undeveloped, underdeveloped countries, uh, developing nations. I was in India a few months ago where we had a meeting and met the five child psychiatrists for 1.2 billion people over 50% of whom are under the age of 30. So there's a problem, a real disconnect. In the present of these data, why is there such a status quo? Why hasn't there been a change? Well, first of all, it's hard to change. None of us like to make changes. But there's also been a lack of empirical evidence to allow us to look at the directions to follow. And when there are data, the analyses are often poor and there's a great, there are a great many mistaken links between correlation and causality. Poor understanding of risk. That is, what is it that creates these problems and where are the opportunities for interventions? And of course, finally, their lack of resources for patient care and research. This is a study that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine last year. It's a remarkable uh, bit of evidence, but one that is really characteristic of the kinds of data that we find when people begin to think about children's uh, developmental disorders, psych developmental psychopathology. 
In this study, you see a very robust correlation uh, at the nearly 0.8 level between the amount of chocolate consumed in, the, in a country and the likelihood of having Nobel laureates. You'll note that Italy needs to catch up and start eating more chocolate. <laughs> but the notion that chocolate consumption in any country plays any role in the intellectual development or scientific improvements in that country is naive and foolish. Now you laugh at this study, but I can show you dozens of studies, and I will mention a couple in my remarks in a moment, that suggest similar silly causal relationships causal relationships. One can correlate many things, but finding causality is a challenge that really requires careful and explicit science. And it begins with careful studies of populations to understand not only the, con the number of people with disorder, but the nature of those disorders. I'm going to talk about two disorders as exemplars. First, autism spectrum disorder, and then second, ADHD, in which I will uh, uh, somewhat disagree with our esteemed colleague, Professor Satorius. This is a slide showing the pro changing prevalence of ASD across countries and over time. And what you can see is that, generally speaking, over the past 20 or 25 years, the prevalence of ASD, autism spectrum disorder, has been rising rather dramatically, raising a great many of concerns about whether there's a, an epidemic of ASD. I, please, I can tell you now, there's no epidemic. You can relax. We don't have to get ASD vaccinations. Uh, but that there is an, a really important story underlying this. If you look at the studies that have been conducted, and these are a series of prevalent studies in the U United Kingdom, and what you see is over time, there's significant change. It goes from 0.1% to 1.6%, a 16-fold increase in a very short period of time, 10 years. The likelihood of that being related to genetics is very small. The possibility of it being related to some toxic or infectious event is reasonable, but one would expect to see other kinds of disorders appearing at the same time. And there have been no changes in prevalence of things like intellectual disability, cerebral palsy, et cetera, other developmental disorders. So it requires that we stop and think for a minute about the data that are presented to us. And what you can see very quickly is that there are a number of big differences in these studies, ranging from the age at which the studies were conducted to the nature of the studies. The bottom study, the one with the lowest prevalent, used only administrative data, the kind of data that are really quite weak, whereas the top study used actually went into schools, both special and regular schools, to try to ascertain all the children. In other words, the message for us is, if you go look for them carefully, you'll find them. And if you don't, or you put your hands over your eyes, you won't. And it has nothing to do with an epidemic. It has to do with the foolishness of the way we conduct our science. This is another way of looking at prevalence studies in, um, in the United Kingdom. And once again, we see whoop, tremendous increases in prevalence, going from 10% uh, 10 per 10,000 to 157 per 10,000. And how did that happen? What, what changed? Well, once again, the sample sizes, the ages of the populations, participation rates in studies, all methodological problems account for the differences in these outcomes. And not that there's a dramatic increase in the number of people with ASD. In fact, based on all these studies, we have no idea how many people really have ASD. And by the way, epidemiologic studies just in counting haven't been alone problematic. This is looking at data on genetic association studies for ASD. And this is from, for a 10 year period from 1999 to 2009. And what you see is a, a relatively robust number of studies. But look at the details. The number of countries where studies were, were conducted is broad. But look at the number of subjects, 17 subjects in a study or 16 sub-controls. And the largest study in this entire group was about 600 individuals, which means that the possibility of having a meaningful finding approaches zero, and yet they've been reported very strongly suggesting that we know something. 
When you aggregate all these data from this time period, the effect side is essentially zero. There's no finding of genetic importance in, in, for the 10 year period. Is the problem that it isn't there? No. The problem is that the science has not been rigorous and that we haven't provided the resources necessary to do the proper study. In my work, we've been focusing on trying to do the study the right way. We went into a Korean population, and we chose it partly because there's nothing, no, no population stratification. It's very important. Everybody in Korea is Korean. It's not multiracial. It's not multiethnic. They're all Korean. And so it makes it easier to do the kind of analyses that you need to do. Um, and what we did is took a population of a, a very large population of 55,000 individuals and screened them and ended up with a prevalence of 2.6%, which led to great controversy. People were, thought we were foolish, that we were nuts, that we were, didn't know what we were doing, all of which may be true, except there are a few things that are very interesting about this work. And I'm just going to show you the, um, the, the bottom two lines here are really critical here. If you look at, in our study, the clinical population, that is those people who were found to have had clinical services, the prevalence was 0.8%. Guess what the repeatedly reported prevalence has been over the past 10 years? About 6 to 10%. What it means is if you go into clinics and look for patients who have illness, you're going to find about 0.8%. But it doesn't tell us about the many people who don't get into the clinics. And just a few minutes ago, I was talking about, and Professor Sartorius was talking about, the lack of clinics, the lack of physicians, the lack of other specialists to take care of these individuals. Why would they go to clinics? It would be the wrong place to find them. And why are we then surprised when there are many who aren't in the clinics? And we don't even talk about disgusting healthcare systems like the one in the United States where people who don't have resources can't get care. And so it shouldn't be a surprise to us that we have to look more broadly. And when we look more broadly, we find some very interesting things. Number one, about two thirds of the patients don't come to the care system. That doesn't mean they don't need care, it just means they don't get there. And that's a problem. That's important information for us. But there's some other things about the phenotype, that is the clinical phenomenon, that are dramatically different. For the longest time, we talked about autism as a disorder in which 75% of the individuals had mental retardation or intellectual disability. That clearly is not the case. In fact, when you look at the populations and divide them between the clinical and non-clinical populations, you see that one-third of the population is clinical, their mean IQ is about 75, whereas the non-clinical have an average distri normal distri whoa, back up. An average distribution of uh, cognitive abilities. And look next, what about the male-female distribution? Previously, we thought males outnumbered females four or five to one with ASD. But in fact, when you look at the broader spectrum, the ratio becomes closer. And in the, in the non-clinical sample, it's about two to one. Now, what does this mean in terms of our understanding about the needs for services? But more importantly, what does it mean about understanding causality? And how do we approach causality? And it may be crucial to separate out intellectual disability from autism spectrum disorders in order for us to fully understand these conditions. There are many other characteristics, but the point is if you don't go look and capture the entire spectrum of a disorder, you're not going to understand it and you're not going to be able to create opportunities for treatment. Now, another one of the factors in all this has been a suggestion that environmental issues cause autism spectrum disorders. I'm going to say now, so I can be really clear, vaccines not only don't cause autism, they definitely do not. In fact, there's data that suggests that vaccines protect people from develop, getting autism. And there's a, there are well-established studies showing that infection, uh, incre uh, and particularly involving the central nervous system, increases the risk of autism. But there are studies that suggest that not 100% of the risk for autism is from genetics. It's substantially genetic, but the association, there's, and there have been demonstrated associations between various prenatal exposures uh, 
um, including infection and uh, toxins that increase the risk of ASD. And so it's important for us not to say ASD is an entirely genetic disorder, but to look at, as we should with all medical disorders, not just psychopathology, that these are gene environment interactions. And we need to understand both the environmental factors and the genetic factors and how they interplay with one another. Because at the end of the day, that's really how we're gonna understand disease. All disease, not just psychopathology. There have been a number of very interesting studies, though, not unlike the chocolate study. In one study in, uh, in the West Coast of the United States, th there's a theory in the U.S. that the U.S. is tipped slightly to the w west, and all the loose marbles roll west. And so they have, unfortunately, I'm moving west, so I don't know what that means. Um, but what this study showed, this was a study looking at rainfall, which you know a lot about in Modena, uh, looking at rainfall and the risk for ASD. And what they found in communities, the higher the precipitation rates were, that the more people had ASD. And they ascribed it to people being inside and being exposed to toxins of some sort inside. The problem is this finding is absolutely meaningless. And there have been similar studies looking at things like TV viewing, um, uh, plant, uh, being near traffic, electric wires, and so on. And the problem is that when you look at group level exposures to environmental factors, it tells you remarkably little about what the cause of the disorder is for a particular individual. It may point you in a in direction, but how do we know a child was even in town during the time it was raining hard? It's all it tells us is it was raining hard in that town. And there's, this is, leads to something that's called an ecological fallacy. The ecological fallacy is two things. Number one, that you, that the, just because there's an environmental factor, you have to know that the individual is exposed to it. And secondly, it has to be plausible. And there's no plausible mechanism that was uh, uh, shown here. And so until one does epidemiologic studies looking at individual exposures, like lead level studies have been, it's gonna be difficult to show causal relationships and it'll distract us from other kinds of work that we need to do. When we also have to look at who we study when we do these kinds of studies, this is a paper that appeared a couple years ago in the American Journal of Psychiatry in which they sh showed or they tried to conclude that genetic heritability played a remarkably less role in the causes of ASD and that environmental factors played a role. Well, they looked at 192 twin pairs, which on the face of it seems quite impressive. Unfortunately, it was, came from a study of 1,100 uh, twin pairs with only a 17% participation rate. And that participation rate proves to be very problematic. Um, and the reason it proves to be problematic is because you don't know whether the people who are in the study represent the total population or not. And in fact, they didn't, despite some analyses to the contrary. In addition, the database that they use, the sample from which they drew the population, is an administrative database, and people move in and out of it. So it's not even representing a, any particular uh, part of the population. So in this case, the kinds of conclusions about environmental factors and, um, and genetic factors could not be arrived at, but nonetheless it became popular. So there are a lot of challenges in doing in epidemiologic studies, and in particular environmental studies. That is, it has to do with selecting environmental factors, which ones, how to protect from the ecological fallacy, how to establish something that's biologically plausible so that it's something that we can truly explore both in humans and then go into animals to try to understand what's happening. And we have to have study populations, samples that are appropriate for the work that we're doing. It is possible, however, there are a number of plausible biological models, and I'm just gonna show you some risk factors at this point. There are studies now that have shown that there are a number of risk factors already in place for autism. Not all the studies show everything, but at least there's some indications. But most of the studies to date have had limitations that I've discussed already. However, we've done an environmental risk study, again going in and taking total population samples and looking at a multiple cohorts to see if you have the same things in similar cohorts. Now, I'm just gonna show you some data quickly um, that'll, um, 
give you some sense. So these are large samples, 15,000, 8,000, 10,000 children. Not, I mean, they're of sufficient size to have power. And what we do is screen them for ASD and then look at it for environmental risk factors. And in one cohort study, in the things in red are statistically significant. And what we find is that in children with medium level ASSQ screening scores, that is the first column, scores 10 to 14, they, they have moderate ASD versus the people in the far right hand column who have high, in, have very symptomatic ASD, that the risks, I don't know why this is going forward, um, that certain things appear. Advanced paternal age, not something previously well understood. Bo uh, um, and parental smoking during pregnancy, a, a general risk for many forms of developmental problems, and maternal drinking, again, not a surprise. In another cohort study, looking at about 3,000 children, we had similar findings. Advanced paternal age appears again, as does smoking, and for some groups, alcohol. So there are convergent data now suggesting that there's an increasing risk for, for certain phenomena causing ASD, which points us clearly in the direction of certain kinds of interventions, certainly decreasing smoking and drinking during pregnancy. This is one other study, again, that shows from a different cohort. Uh, this is a subpopulation of an epidemiologic study, but again, highly powerful advanced paternal age at smoking and drinking during pregnancy. Uh, really amenable to interventions uh, readily available to us. This is a study that shows us that also socioeconomic status, disadvantage, increases the risk of ASD, but n only for those individuals who are not intellectually disabled. So the risk of intellectual disability may be a different phenomenon. And this study from the American Journal of Psychiatry, uh, this is a, a Swedish cohort, shows that Birth weight also plays a role in risk, with very low birth weight and very high birth weight increasing risk, which, by the way, is also applies to other medical problems, not just ASD. In the past five years, there have been a lot of changes in ASD, with larger samples, better measurement, and the estimates are that about 25% of the cases can be attributable to specific risk factors, mostly specific alleles or groups of alleles, but some environmental factors clearly play a role. The past five years have seen enormous change, largely because of changes in samples and the kind of patients that we have access to, which is broader than just those who show up in clinics. But we only understand risk, and causality is a long way to go, and sampling remains to be a problem for us. The problem is similar for ADHD, where prevalence rates, at least in the United States, appear to be high and, and stable. These are, I'm going to look quickly at some data on prevalence, but also services, so you get some sense of what's going on. This is from the NHANES study, which is an epidemiologically ascertained sample of about 8,500 children from across the United States. And it's a multiple stage process where you ascertain a po population in a community, then you screen them, then you do uh, detailed evaluations, and they actually saw all the children. And these are the ages of the children and the rough sample size. Uh, and parents that were, parents were talked to as well as the children. And there were a number of interviews and medical examinations and follow-up questionnaires. And they looked for multiple diagnoses, including ADHD, so comorbidity was part of the question. And this has been published in, uh, uh, pre previously. But the point here is that the prevalence of ADHD in the United States in this study, a 12-month prevalence, that is during a 12-month period, 8.7%. Now, some of you may say, well, wait a minute, this is manufactured by the drug companies, or, or this is nonsense, this is a hyperactive children because they get too much sugar. What I can tell you is these are children who have a cluster of symptoms that impair their functioning. They have trouble with other children, they have trouble in school, they have trouble at home, and they have trouble in at least two environments to the point that it's, it's causing difficulties. Whether they've gotten care or not is another story. By the way, we should ask about did they get care. Of the individuals who had these symptoms that were impairing their functioning, only about half or less got care. Males more likely than females, largely because they're likely to be more behaviorally disruptive. But this is a disorder for which we have a treatment. 
or multiple treatments, both psychosocial treatments and medication treatments that have high levels of efficacy and effectiveness, and yet fewer than half of the children get care. What's going on? What's the problem? And by the way, we can also see that there are demographic variables that allow us to target populations. So males are more likely to have difficulty, uh, Caucasians are more likely to have difficulty, and so on. This is another study. This is the National Comorbidity Study in which they went back and did a supplement on uh, adolescents, 10,000 individuals. This was published in 2010. And you can see the distribution. These are children across the age of adolescence, representative of the United States, a representative epidemiologic sample. And what they did is this is a school primarily and household-based uh, intervention. And they found a prevalence, a lifetime prevalence of ADHD of 12.9% for males, 4.1% for females, with a mean of about 8%. Okay, does this mean that 12% of individuals have ADHD throughout their lifespan? No, or males. What it means is that within a 12-month period, a significant group of individuals met criteria for disorder. Some of them come into disorder and go out, some of them remain chronic. But the point is, probably at any point in time, 8% of individuals are adversely affected by this condition. And we can even see the pattern for the disorder because we watch the onset. With the peak onset somewhere between the ages of six and eight, and then flattening out. And looking at, by, these are, by the way, you can see different symptoms with um, the purple line at the top is ADHD, and then those are the symptom patterns for males. And what's interesting is the symptom pattern is somewhat different for females, with inattention being a much more dominant uh, factor than uh, behavioral activity. So we now know when you sample properly that it's not only common, but it's different in boys and girls. And so the kind of interventions we need to do are different. And then looking at services. These are the same group of kids. Over the past 12 months, m about half of them got services in school. A third of them got services from the mental health system. And about 20% got services from, um, from a primary care physician. Again, a disorder for which we have well-established, empirically validated treatments. And yet, a common condition, we don't, have treat we don't get the children to services. What does that mean? And by the way, of those children who did get medications, only 17% of them got the best medication that's well-studied. By the way, long before the pharmaceutical industries were in it. The first report on the treatment of ADHD with stimulant medications was in 1930s. Not long before uh, the drug companies were interested in this disorder. So what are the challenges in research and, and developmental psychopathology? What are we facing what comes forward? Well, there are many type, two, type 1 errors with multiple comparisons and type 2 errors with studies that are too small, and many errors in misclassification of phenotype and exposure to environmental factors. In short, there have been many experimental errors, largely because the studies are underfunded and don't have sufficient scope. They're confounding errors. We don't account for things that m make big differences. And we have co uh, complications because we only use clinical samples. So what have we learned? Risk factors have to be measured at an individual level. and we, They must be associated with a plausible disease mechanism. We can do that now. And study subjects and study design are, are critical. We really have to think about how to put together the studies that are ep using epidemiologically ascertained populations that are really representative of a real population and not just clinical. They have to include both clinical and non-clinical samples. And because we're studying developmental disorders, they have to be longitudinal. And there are a number of longitudinal methods we can use to understand development and, and disease states and how they change over time. And but I think we can say some things with great, great certainty. Among childhood onset disorders, developmental psychopathology is the most prevalent group of conditions. By far, no question, no, no disagreement. High, they're high impact disorders, and at least 50% or more are chronic. That is, they stay through childhood and often progress into adolescence. But proper phenotyping, characterizing these disorders, requires uh, correct sampling that are representative. 
And prime, well, the other thing we know is that primary care providers are poorly prepared to diagnose and treat these disorders. They're not trained to do it, and when you survey primary care providers, they tell you repeatedly that this is a deficit in their training and they wish they could go back and get it. And the public and private systems, as we've, we heard from uh, Dr. Sartorius, but you'll hear again and again, are poorly prepared to support these patients. But there are real targets for intervention and prevention, yet only 25% get care. Is this acceptable? Would this be tolerated for diabetes or cancer? Absolutely not. It would be in every newspaper in the country every day. But we tolerate it. It's a low priority. But we understand the problem. There's a saying that is wisdom is knowing what to do and virtue is doing it. With respect to developmental psychopathology, we have the wisdom and we know exactly what to do. This is not difficult. We know what to do for patient care and we know what to do for research. But do we have virtue? I think that's an open question. It's why we're here today, both as individuals and as a community. Rather than saying, do we have virtue, I want to end by asking whether you have virtue. What are you going to do? Not what are we going to do, but what responsibility is each of us going to take to change the status quo? Because if we don't change the status quo, we know for sure we're creating generation after generation of children who have handicaps and disabilities that are unnecessary and can be well treated and mediated. Thank you.